I now uh, invite Shubhad Ji Das, a professional uh, storyteller, uh, to uh, present uh, her paper. Her paper is on the evolution of Tolpava Kutu, a ritualistic art form. She's a seasoned banker turned early educator, a professional storyteller. And you know, after eight years of Clatter and clink, she's found music midst the giggles and guffers of children. And there has been no looking back since then, she says. So that just uh, uh, you know, tells how much uh, storytelling is uh, important to her. So uh, it happened, storytelling happened to her as a professional hazard and has since uh, shared myriad stories with children uh, uh, and Elders who are children at heart, she says, across various festivals, schools, libraries of repute. Her repertoire includes performances at Jaipur Literature Festival, outreach program, Ganga Utsav, Zero Festival of Music, to name just a few. She specializes in retelling folk tales, Malayalam classics, and stories based on the cultural heritage with a contemporary edge. And when she's not telling either of them, she prefers to write an original narrative. She's a writer uh, herself. A multifaceted uh, personality, Shubhaji Das, I now uh, request her to present her paper. You have uh, 15 minutes, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv Kumarji. A very good morning to all of you. Firstly, I would like to thank the entire team of Indica for giving me this opportunity to present my paper amidst all of you. It's my very first time and it's been a great learning experience. So without further ado, I move on to my paper. So as you all can see, the title of my paper is Evolution of Dol Pavakuta, a Ritualistic Art Form. Now, this literally translates to the leather shadow puppet. Just give me a minute, it is not. This literally translates to leather shadow puppet or leather puppet play or a shadow play. Now through this paper of mine, what I plan to bring to the fore, or should I say the collection of stories that I plan to bring to the fore is about how Tol Pavakuta and from being an indigenous art form has moved or transitioned into a contemporary art form. And this is, and I've done this by analyzing the three main features, which is the narrative, the narration, and the narrators involved. The focus group here is the Kavalapara troupe of puppeteers. So the story begins here. Uh, the story comes to you from the time when not, not all was well in the Devlok. The two eternal forces, the Asuras and the Devas, were at constant loggerheads. And if this was not enough, an Asura by the name Darika had earned himself a boon to be invincible. Now, with the confidence of being invincible, he started harassing the Rishis and the Devas with an intention to take over the Devalok. Now, when Shiva got to know about this, he was infuriated. And so he created Bhadrakali with an intention to kill Darika. And the moment she was created, he instructed her to go and kill Darika. Now, Badrakali knew this was not going to be an easy task, but she was persistent. She knew she had to use a bit of trickery to get to overpower Darika. And after a prolonged battle, she finally was successful in severing the head of Darika and she carried it in her hand and went to Kailash. Now, when she went to Kailash, the grapevine and Devlok, she got to know that while she was away, Rama fought Ravana and finally killed him. Now this really upset her because she had wanted to witness this epic battle. So she went to Shiva and expressed her desire to watch this battle and the killing of Ravana once again. Now Shiva was very pleased with Bhadrakali because she had carried the task that was assigned to her. But at the same time, she, he knew that killing Ravana was not, again, was not an option. So he thought for a while, and he blessed her, saying that she would be worshipped as a goddess, especially in the area surrounding the river Nila. And in doing so, the people on earth will reenact the 
story of Rama and Ravana through the shadows. And that is how Tolpavakuta entered the ritualistic trope, with the epic story of Ramayana being its narrative. Now this started getting carried forward from one generation to other until it reached the generation of late Guru Krishnan Guti Pulagar. Like all the other art forms, this art form had started facing the wrap of time. It had begun to fade away. But Krishnan Guti Pulagar was not somebody who was ready to give up because he was a self-taught artist. He had lost his father at a very early age and so he had decided that he was going to keep this art form alive and not just alive, but alive and thriving. Now the version of Ramayana that is followed in Tolpava Kuta is a Kamba, Kam, it's called Kamba Ramayana because it is written by the poet Kambar. Now there's also a story, a very interesting story that it was Shiva who himself took birth as Kamban and wrote this um, you know, version of Ramayana, but that's a story for another time and it will also be reflecting in my paper. Due to shortage of time, I move ahead. In, uh, my paper. So when um, when Krishna Gotipula had decided that he was going to keep this art form alive and thriving, he started questioning the norms. Now it is understood that when a ritualistic practice that goes on in the premises of the temple, then it is not accessible to the common man. In fact, the sole audience of this art form was the goddess herself. So he felt that why was this so and a beautiful art form as this was supposed to be available to the common man. And with an intention to do that, he began working on creating an abridged version of Ramayana. So the original version that was used to perform the formal practices was for about 210 hours. But when he created a shorter version, it came after just about an hour, which showcased just the battle between Rama and Ravana and the few highlights of the story. Well, it's interesting to see that, you know, in today's times, there's even a capsule version, a three minute version for the YouTube and Facebook like online platforms. But this changed the narrative of Tol Kuta because when he abridged the stories, the time reduced and he took it outside the temple premises for the common man to watch and view. And because of this, it opened up possibilities for Tol Kuta to explore newer narratives and newer stories. And these are some of the stories that Tol Kuta explored. That's the stories of Mahatma Gandhi, stories of Christ, stories for special days such as International Yoga Day or Children's Day. They even have an interesting collection of uh, presentations for stories from the Panchatantra. And the most recent contemporary story that they have performed is the Pen Pavakuta, which is a story on gender equality. And then there's the story on river conservation, which is in search of Nila. Now, this is a project that I was personally involved, in, and it was because of this project that I took, I which in you know developed the interest in me towards this art form, and I began delving deeper into this. So it is interesting to see that by slightly adapting the narrative, it has opened up the possibilities for growth for this art form. Now, moving on to the narration. What is narration? Is it, it, is it just telling a story or is it the mellifluous coming together or the seamless coming together of various elements? So it, is, it becomes in, imperative that when newer narrators are adapted, the elements that goes into the narration of a story also evolve. Now in the following slides, you're gonna see how the changes have taken place. Now what you see here, the first picture is a Kutamadam or the playhouse. Now this was the actual stage where the Tolpava Kuta formal practice was being staged. In fact, it is being it is staged even today. And this is built right opposite the shrine so that the, it is assumed that the goddess can see the play that is being staged here. And below that is a 12 meter long Aya Purava. Now this is a white cloth that assumes the role of a canvas where the puppeteers paint the story with the dexterous movement of their puppets that are painstakingly made on leather, painted with natural dyes. And they come into life against the warm light exuded by the de-husked coconut shells, like you can see in the picture there. Now behind this Ayapurava, there is a wooden panel that you can see here. And this is where they keep the coconut 
shell lamps. Now, as the narratives changed, they had to make changes to the elements of the narration so that it could suit the places that it went to. And when they left out of the temple premises, all the state world became their stage and places like schools, colleges, auditoriums. In fact, even the gardens and the streets had the pleasure of hosting this most coveted art form. It is also interesting to note how the Ayapurva graciously made way to the projector. As you can see in the picture here, you know, the background has been projected onto the projector and the puppets come to life against these uh, projector screens. Now, as they moved spaces, the Velakkamadam, which is made out of the wooden plank, took place of the angle slot and gave place to the slotted angle rods and steel lamps as these were lighter and easier to handle and transport. The goat hides and the deer hides that were used to make the puppets to make those beautiful translucent puppets accepted open-heartedly their more user-friendly options the cardboard and acrylic sheets what you see here are people trying their hands at crafting puppets out of cardboards so it's interesting to see as to how these elements do change with time but how the different aspects, the traditional aspect and the contemporary aspects are harmoniously thriving with an intention, with a unified intention of taking this art form forward. Now we moved to the narrator. Who is the narrator? Is the narrator the one who tells the story? Is he the sutradhar who holds together all the elements of the story? Or is he the custodian of the art form? Or is he all this and more? And we shall look into this in the coming slides. Now, Kerala is a home to five shadow puppetry troops, of which uh, the Kavalapara troop or Konantara troop is the most uh, surviving one at the moment. Uh, Guru late Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna Guti Pulavar was a part of this particular troop. Now, uh, this is the only troop today that has been able to sustainably keep uh, you know economically sustain this art form and there's a story behind this now it is said and this is a the story is does not have a written evidence it is a part of an oral history uh, but it is still popular among the puppeteers it is said that the kavalapara mupal nayar a feudal king and his wife was unable to birth an egg and the king was really upset about this and at this juncture, an oracle visited him and told him that it would be good that he, if he could conduct a Tol Pavakuta performance as a votive offering to the goddess. So immediately the king invited the puppeteers and asked them to perform at the Aryangava for 21 days. Now, as expected, after the performance, the, the couple was blessed with the child. And as a mark of gratitude, Kavlapara Mopil Nair offered these puppeteers a land to cultivate on, a place to stay, and he acknowledged their artisanal skills. Now, this was a very important step in the metamorphosis of this art form, because the puppeteers who were nomadic artists had now converted into agrarians, where in the first four months, they performed at the annual temple festivals, and the rest of the months, they, um, they got to cultivation. Now, the narrator in Dolpava Kuta is known as a Pulavar. A Pulavar means a Pandit or a scholar. The person who narrates the Dolpava Kuta is expected to be a scholar who is proficient in Malayalam, in Tamil and in Sanskrit. He is expected to learn the uh, almost 1200 to 2000 verses and was not allowed to forget. I mean, forgetting was not at all an option at all. And he also was expected to have knowledge on a wide range of topics because it was not just the narration of verses, but the explanation that followed, which added context to the story. Now, if I had to quote an example, when the Pulavar narrates the verses, chants the verses, his co-artist could pose 
any question. Now, if it was a scene wherein Sita was expecting, then the co-artist could ask him questions about the Ayurvedic medicines that an expectant mother should be having, or the health care that an expectant mother should be given, or the state of mind of an expectant mother. And the pullover was expected to know the answers to all these questions. So you see, the question could come from any area, and he was expected to know. Now, all of these made it a very stringent sphere for younger generation to enter. They felt it was difficult because they had to spend hours together learning these verses. The Krishna Guti Pulavar uh, decided that he had to change this. Now that he had opened up the story and this art form into the public, he had to do something to bring in new custodians to this art form. And thus he wrote the only version, performance version of this art form. And this made the art form more appealing to the younger generation. And that is what you're seeing here. You can see as young as a four-year-old child sitting and learning this art form. And that is what this, this change has brought in for the art form. Now, when Krishna Guti Pulavar sir expired in the year 2000, he left behind a legacy of dreams for his sons, Padma Sri Ramachandra Pulavar and Lakshman Pulavar. Padma Sri Ramachandra Pulavar is the present guiding force of the Kunatara troop or the Kavalapara troop, who is supported by his family, who are all puppeteers. As you can see in the picture, we have Raji Pulavar, Rahul Pulavar, and Rajita Pulavar, his daughter, and his wife, who is also equally and actively involved in this art form, in taking forward this art form. Now, all of them together and in their individual capacity started assuming roles other than that of a narrator. They took up roles of that of the facilitator, of the trainer. And as they opened, as the art form opened up spaces, it invited women to enter into this art form. Yes, even today, the women are not allowed to perform in the temples. But in the contemporary space, women are playing a great role as puppeteers. In fact, they are not a part of this art form just as puppeteers, but they are also a part of this art form as artepreneurs. Yes, that's a new word that I coined, which means entrepreneurs who abuse their crafting skills to make it more economically viable. And that, now this is the all women um, team, puppeteer team of Kavalapara troop. So when they opened up the avenues, a whole new world of merchandise was born, adding on to the economical viability of this art form. There's one more thing that I missed telling you was with the onslaught of pandemic, the idea of space as well changed, the concept of cha space changed, and the puppeteers now took on to the World Wide Web as their stage. And they started performing on Zoom and on Facebook. And me being a Keralite who lives just an hour away from the main Kunatara or the Kavalatara troop, got to watch the first puppetry performance online on Facebook when IGNCA conducted a festival. So you see, it has made the art form accessible to people like me, who in spite of being there could not, I mean, I would call it my ignorance, but yes, I'm glad that now I'm opened or I'm introduced to into this world. So it is interesting to note as to how Tolpavakuta, with its strong ritualistic core, has the potential to be a modern art form with a wider appeal to young and old equally. And it is also remarkable that the puppeteers have assumed the roles of custodians of the art form and have strived to retain the traditional practices intact while making it economically sustainable by exploring newer mediums of expression and formats of performances. Hope you all had a good time listening to my paper. Thank you so much, uh, Shubhaji. I think it was a fascinating uh, presentation, uh, to say the least. I think um, I mean, you have, you have portrayed yeah. evolution of the storytelling art form and how, you know, with the times, what kind of changes happen naturally and the ability of the tradition to evolve with times without losing its essence, but you know, continuously changing the external forms. I think that he's that has been uh, a mainstay with Bharatiya Parampara, and I think it was beautifully portrayed uh, in this. Thank you so much.